Thanks. Um, well, it's wonderful to be here this morning, and uh, I really appreciate uh, being asked to come and talk to you today about some of the work that we've been doing. And um, as Balash said, he's been involved in this work, as has, have many people. Um, a few of them are listed here. I'm going to be talking about some global work that we've been doing, some global watershed modeling work. Um, this work has really been looking at how watersheds and land use, um, changes in watersheds are affecting the delivery of nutrients, nitrogen, phosphorus, carbon, and silica, to coastal systems by rivers. Uh, but before I sort of go into what the modeling work is and some, I, some information about the spatial and temporal scales, I want to give you a little bit of background on the motivation for this. And the motivation um, is, um, as mentioned, that humans are really changing our landscape, um, both um, by the food production in watersheds, the energy production, the high population. I understand that the world population reached 7 billion this week. Um, and as a result of those activities and others, there's increased inputs of nitrogen, phosphorus, um, increased mobilization of carbon, silica, that are entering our rivers, and a portion of that is being transported downstream to our coastal systems. And once in the coastal system, those nutrients can lead to a large range of environmental problems, including algal blooms, some of which are toxic to ecosystems or to humans. Um, as well as decreases in oxygen, resulting in hypoxic zones, anoxic zones in our coastal systems. So this work was really motivated by trying to understand how the changes in watersheds, um, including changes in hydrology, um, are it changing nutrient inputs to coastal zones so that we can better understand where the source of the problems in our coastal zones are coming from. So now, a little bit about the model, just very briefly. It is a global model. It's a global watershed model. Um, and it's called NEWS, Global NEWS, Nutrient Export from Watersheds. And we can think of the model as sort of having three components, four components. There are nutrient sources in each of the watersheds. There are various hydrological and physical factors that modify the transfer of nutrients from the land to the river system. And then once in the river, there's in-river processing. The hydrological component of this is from STN30, um, delineating over 5,000 watersheds globally. So just a little bit of detail um, about the components of the model. Um, we have nutrient sources um, at half degree by half a degree um, for each of those watersheds from both natural sources and from a range of anthropogenic sources. Those anthropogenic sources, many of them are related to um, agriculture, um, also to energy production, that's the atmospheric nitrogen deposition coming from NOx emissions from fossil fuel combustion, as well as um, sewage inputs. Um, I'll say a little bit more about that in a minute, but the hydrological and physical factors then are responsible for moving a portion of these inputs in the water on the landscape into the river system. And then once in the river, there are a range of uh, processes, biological um, mainly, uh, processes within the river that remove a portion of those um, elements, um, including removal in reservoirs behind dams. The output then of the model is nitrogen, phosphorus, carbon, and silica loading to coastal waters. And um, while many of you probably aren't nutrient biogeochemists, uh, maybe some of you are. Um, so we're not only modeling the export of nitrogen, phosphorus, carbon, and silica um, elements, but the different forms of those. So the dissolved inorganic forms, the dissolved organic, and the particulate forms. Today I'm going to talk a little bit about um, the dissolved inorganic, which think of it as ammonia and nitrate, very bioavailable, very reactive for biological systems. Uh, the dissolved inorganic phosphorus, phosphate, again, very reactive. And the dissolved organic carbon, I'll talk a little bit about that as well. But the model is doing um, all of these elements and forms. Another thing to remember is that the output of the model 
uh, main output is the export of these at the mouth of the river as it enters the coastal zone. So I'm not going to go into the model equations. I've just listed a very small portion of it to let you know that basically it's linear equations, relatively simple, um, uh, relating the inputs um, to the landscape, to inputs to the river system, and then export at the river mouth. If anyone is interested in the details of it, um, all the model equations and uh, the explanations of it are in a paper by Mayorga um, that I'll show you at the end the citation for that. So today I'm going to talk about a number of applications of the model. First, the global application. Um, then an application at smaller scales, um, one into the Yangtze River watershed, um, and then some sub-basin applications. And then if we have time, uh, I'll say a little bit about some scenarios for future uh, conditions that we've run. So first, the basics, the global watershed application. The inputs are at half a degree by half a degree. Uh, the output is for the whole watershed, so the export at the river mouth itself. So while the inputs, um, also I need to mention that while the inputs are all at half a degree by half a degree, um, though most of those into the inputs into the watershed are then averaged for the model calculations, um, going into the model calculations to calculate an output from the watershed as a whole. And you'll see this in a few minutes in some of the output. Um, the run for this is basically very early 2000 year. Um, not that explicitly 2005 exactly, of course, because we don't have all the inputs for an exact year, um, but basically early 2000. And as I said, there are over 5,000 watersheds um, in this. So the time step is annual average. Um, so why annual? Well, the basic reason is that while we would really like to have much higher temporal resolution than that, seasonal, daily, even shorter time, um, and the constraining factor really is that the input databases were not available. Um, at a, most of them were not available at all. We had to create them. And um, the information that we had to create those was not really of, a, of the kind that we could um, do seasonal um, inputs. Um, for example, while, of course, global watersheds don't change um, on time scales that we're dealing with, um, and we, could have, we do have some information on changes at shorter time scales and annual on water runoff and precipitation intensity. For the other um, types of information that we needed, there just was not information available at um, lower than annual scale. For example, for the fertilizer use, um, we had to use FAO data, which is reported at the national scale, annually. We then took land use to distribute that fertilizer use, as well as the different crop types within that grid, um, and the fertilizer use by crop type to calculate the input for that particular data layer. Um, so there was not information available then for how fertilizer use varied, for example, over the course of the year, especially when you're looking at the global scale. Similarly, um, we didn't have information on, um, not enough information to understand how in-river processes, biological processes globally change at seasonal scales or shorter time scales. But also, very importantly, in overall, at the global scale, there was not data to look at to either calibrate in certain cases or validate the model output. Most of the river loading data, when you look at a global picture, the data available is really usually reported just on an annual basis, the annual loading. And this gives you the, some idea of the amount of information that was available for global rivers on inorganic nitrogen export, for example. You can see there's quite a few rivers, but nowhere near you know, anywhere near the 5,000 watersheds that we were dealing with. Um, and similarly for dissolved organic carbon. But this also shows you how the modeled output and the measured compare. So quite, quite favorably. And also we had data over a fairly wide range of um, export rates as well as um, geographic distribution. Um, all the way from the uh, Mississippi, the Ganges, the Rhine, down to some um, rivers in the Arctic region.
This data, and for almost all of these rivers, was also only available for an annual export for comparison with the model. And this just shows you um, the model output at the global scale. And this is really the first um, global picture of nitrogen, phosphorus, carbon, and silica export by rivers globally. And this brings you back also to the point of spatial scale. As I said, while the input was at the half a degree um, level, for most of the parameters, we averaged that then for the watershed to do the calculation. And so the, um, the, the output here is the average output that gets to the river mouth, um, averaged over the whole watershed as a yield. So it would be the average um, um, inorganic nitrogen export per kilometer, shed of, per kilometer squared of watershed per year. And as you can see, there are many hot spots, both in Europe and in the eastern portion of the US and Central America, but also very importantly, in Asia. And I'll come back to that towards the end of the talk. But it really gives us a global picture of what the current conditions are with respect to, in this case, inorganic nitrogen export um, on an average watershed basis. This is called a yield. So now I want to move on to a, another application. So we, are, we developed this model to give us an annual sort of average for some sort of decadal um, range um, originally. But we also wanted to see if we had input data on an annual basis, what, how good would the model compare to the measured export by a river? And very fortunately, one of the people working with us, um, uh, Jan, had, uh, from China, was able to compile all the inputs we needed um, for the Yangtze River Basin at the province level over a 30-year period, so annually for a 30-year period. So what we did is we were able to take that data, which he compiled um, for each of the provinces um, for every year between 1970 and 2003. This is some of the data you can see. You can see the changes in the big um, increase in nitrogen input to the watershed. And then run the model just for the Yangtze and compare it to the measured export um, of the Yangtze River. And we were quite pleasantly surprised um, to see that even doing these calculations on an annually over this 30-year period, that the model, I think, captured very well the interannual variability, the overall trend. Um, although be before 1985, there's clearly a difference between the measured and the model, an offset of the model predicted being greater than the measured. Um, we're now trying to go in and understand more about why those differences happened. Is it different, you know, maybe the input data weren't as good before 85. Um, there have been obviously some big changes in uh, China um, around about that time and uh, compared to after that time. But basically, we were quite surprised and happy. There was no change in the model configuration at all that we had used at the global scale, simply applying it and running the model annually. So what I've been talking about so far is, as I said, just the output at the, at the mouth of the river, averaging the inputs over the whole watershed to do the calculation. Of course, we also would like to see within basin um, variability, within basin uh, differences in uh, transport of elements. Um, so John Harrison um, has developed then a, was able to um, run the dissolved inorganic phosphorus model at, the, at a half a degree um, scale um, for, again, the early 2000 conditions. Um, the difference here was that he took the same input data at a half a degree scale, but using a river routing was able to um, capture the upstream inputs for each grid of dissolved inorganic phosphorus coming down the river, plus the inputs at that grid, and then do the calculation for many different, for each about half a degree grid globally. And I'll show you the output for that. And that's John up here in the left-hand corner. Um, has been very important in the whole global news um, activities. So he spent a lot of time getting data globally for dissolved inorganic phosphorus at sub-basin scales. And you can sort of see, hopefully, some of the information he was able to capture. 
Uh, but you can also see that most of the data still is at the river mouth. Um, it's very hard to get global coverage or anywhere near a global coverage for within basin information. Um, but when he did compare the model output run at that smaller scale um, with the measured, again, there's a fairly good relationship there between the measured and the model output. So um, again, taking the same model configuration that was developed for a whole watershed calculation and using it at finer scale resolution um, did reasonably well. This shows the comparison then of the global application at average watershed scale at the top, um, with the blue colors again being low yield and the yellow and um, redder colors being higher yield, um, to the application at the half a degree scale on the bottom here, so sub-basin scale. And as you might expect, there's a, a considerable um, similarity, um, but much higher resolution and information at a smaller scale. So this was a very interesting, and I think quite successful application um, of the model at that much smaller scale. So again, um, here we see most of the hot spots being in eastern U.S., a little bit on the western U.S., a little bit in Central Asia, certainly Europe, and um, again, Southern and Eastern Asia. He also has applied um, the dissolved organic carbon model um, at small watersheds in Central California using inputs at one kilometer squared resolution. So a, even a smaller ap scale application. Um, about 14 watersheds in the Central Valley of California um, shown here. Um, where there were um, inputs available um, from a variety of sources at high resolution. Um, comparing again the modeled DOC output with the measured. Again, a reasonably good um, comparison there. And again, it was the same model that we had used, the same configuration we'd used for the global scale calculations, but now a plot used with a much higher resolution input information. So finally then, um, I, in the last few minutes, how many minutes do I have left, Balash? A couple, a couple minutes, five minutes, okay. I wanted to show you um, another reason that we actually developed this model was to explore what some potential future conditions might look like and how nutrient export around the world might vary under a range of different scenarios. So in this case, what we did is, and I'll explain it a little bit in a minute, um, we used the same you know, approach that we used for the, uh, the first application, the global application, input at a half a degree, um, average output for the watersheds. Um, and in this case now, we, w we developed um, inputs under different scenarios for the year 2000, 2030 and 2050. Uh, I'll, I'll just talk a little bit about the 2030 um, now. But the idea was is that we wanted to help, ex we wanted to explore how different policy options and costs in watersheds to control nutrients and nutrient use um, would translate into the amount of nitrogen and phosphorus um, used, produced by food production and energy production in watersheds globally, um, how that then would translate into the nutrient export and eventually to be able to look at coastal ecosystem effects and how those might be changing. So what we used were the Millennium Assessment and Millennium Ecosystem Assessment storylines to develop input databases that were consistent with the storylines. I'm going to, talk, going to talk about two of those scenarios, the global orchestration and the adapting mosaic, sort of funny names, but that's what they call them. The point being is that the global orchestration you can think of as being a very reactive approach to environmental problems with the world being very globalized in terms of decision making, in terms of trade, etc. And in sort of a, con a very contrasting scenario, adapting mosaic is one in which there's a real proactive approach to addressing environmental problems 
using nutrient, um, very good nutrient management on the landscape, um, et cetera, and a more regionalized approach to making decisions um, about um, various transactions. So I'm going to call the global orchestration so it's easy to remember a business as usual, because really it's kind of the trajectories that we're on now. Um, and the adapting mosaic you can think of as a better case scenario. Um, now, all of the assumptions that went into this include a wide range of social, economic, policy, and ecological considerations. Um, and of course, we had to develop the input databases, gridded input databases for these scenarios for these years. So it was a huge effort in developing these input databases. Um, I'm just going to give you a little bit of a flavor um, of what the difference in these two is. Take the, we call the, I guess I call it the worst case scenario, but business as usual in some cases. Um, the fertilizer use is high still, more like it is in the US. Um, nutrient management on the landscape is not really optimized. Um, meat consumption is high, similar to what we, in many regions of the world, similar to what we have in the US. Um, in other words, you might think of the southern and eastern Asia, which has a low meat consumption now under this scenario, is growing and increasing more towards what we have. And access to sewage treatment is complete, full. Um, so in other words, it's all going into pipes um, and um, discharged into water systems, basically. Um, under the better case scenario, uh, moderate use of fertilizer, uh, a very efficient nutrient management on the landscape, a much more moderate meat consumption, et cetera. But the thing to remember is, is that each country um, had different uh, trajectories for these things. You had to con we had to consider what the current condition is now um, and how that might change in the future. So it's, um, the specifics, in other words, vary by country. And this next slide is, is not, is, I want you to just get a general impression of how we develop these input databases. Um, basically, we, had, we used a, the image model, the integrated assessment model, to develop these inputs, taking into consideration the potential, the expected distribution of population, um, and what their uh, food demands or needs would be, considering the different um, options there of how much meat, et cetera, they would be eating. Um, then that was taken. Um, also taken into consideration is the available land for growing that food, the available water for irrigation as needed. Depending on the amount of meat consumption and the assumptions there, the types and number of animals that had to be raised were considered. Um, that, of course, results in manure production. And, of course, the num amount of meat production also has big implications for the amount of crops that you have to grow to feed those animals, in addition to the, the crops that are eaten directly uh, by humans. Um, and there's a climate model behind this, fairly simple climate model, um, and also an energy model, because um, there's biofuel production as well. But this basically is just to give you an idea of um, the different, actually, model components, um, additional model components uh, that were used to develop the input databases so that we could explore different policy options. So just one um, uh, graph of output um, showing the results. This for inorganic nitrogen now is um, mapped out as the change in inorganic nitrogen export by rivers for Asia and Africa and Europe. And you can see under the global orchestration, which is the very, um, you, know, you might think of it as aggressive um, or um, not envir very environmentally um, optimized scenario, there's a, I'm going to focus on uh, southern and eastern Asia right now, um, is that you see that under sort of a business as usual scenario, business as usual being that um, the tra current trajectories are basically continued, um, that there's a large increase would be expected in, in this case, nitrogen export by rivers in this area. Already a hot spot under current conditions, but a very much larger increase over the next, well, this was over a 30 year, next 30 years. 
And this compares then or contrasts to the scenario in which there was much more um, efficiency of nutrient use on the landscape, changes in technology, et cetera. Um, and in that case, the changes in export are much smaller than under the global orchestration scenario, and in some cases, even a decrease in nitrogen export. So um, this just gives us some idea of what some of maybe possibilities are, um, a way to explore some future possible conditions. And then we can also back out of the model what the improvements um, in nutrient use efficiency um, and technology that led to these differences in the two scenarios um, really mainly increased fertilizer um, management on the landscape, um, lower meat consumption, um, and um, a little bit from sewage um, increased efficiencies, um, but primarily resulting from the agricultural sector. So, I guess I've tried to show you then, I hope I've showed you and you've seen how we've developed this global model. We're looking at how land use in watersheds globally is affecting nutrient transport to coastal systems, um, how the model works under in a very specific watershed um, over annually over a 30-year period, its application at sub-basin scales, and also how we're using it now to explore some different scenarios of possible future conditions. We've also run it um, in a, um, for 1970 as well, so looking at some hind casting. So if anybody's interested in uh, more details on the model equations um, and explanations, um, Mayorga et al. paper, Emilio Mayorga's paper in environmental modeling and software uh, can give you a lot of details. The input databases and a lot of the information that I talked about today is also in a special issue of Global Biogeochemical Cycles published last year. So thank you. Any questions? Of course. I'm really curious about what's in the model, uh, but I know we can't get into that. But the last time I saw a diagram like that, wiring diagram like that, I, I, I suppose was a long time ago in the in the population um, models that came out. Oh, geez, what in the '60s, I suppose. And you mentioned that at least in the nitrogen case, the the equations are linear. And so you're, you're presumably, what, inverting a whole system of, of linear algebraic equations to time step forward. And, um, can you say more, I, I guess my question is, can you say more about um, modeling aspects and where you see the critical problems? The critical problems. Um Let's see, first of all, the wiring diagram was only a wiring diagram of the image model, which isn't the global news model. That's an integrated assessment model. Um, and it was, it was uh, just to try and show you some of the different components. Okay. Um, and that was what was used to develop just the input databases for the scenario applications for 2030 and 2050. Okay. Um, but back to um, your question about the news model itself, um, there, um, some of the challenges and some of the, um, what we would like to see as improvements in the future would be more of a dynamic modeling um, approach where we can look at time lags in the system, when we, where we can look at, um, uh, for example, um, smaller time steps because in, in reality, the, the effects in the coastal zone don't happen on an average annual scale, right? The, the biology is very fast and responsive. And so we would certainly like to be able to look at more seasonal variation. Um, we have been doing some seasonal variation um, modeling now, explo exploration for the inorganic nitrogen and phosphorus. And uh, John says that that's going quite well. Um, but we don't have the publications from that yet. 
Um, so I would say that more of a dynamic system would be very useful. Um, and um, actually, what we also really need is, a, is more data to see how well the model is doing. Um, we can do all sorts of di you know, much more detailed calculations and time varying. But unless we have the um, measured data to in rivers to compare it to, um, then we're on very thin ground. So um, that's one of the things that we certainly would like to have more of. Most of that type of information is only available for the US, so a very, very small portion of the world, and under very limited conditions compared to what we see in other regions. So those are some of the, the things that we'd like to see improvements on. Very nice talk. Um, I had no idea this was even going on. This is great. Uh, so I'm, I'm happy this is not part of my domain. A couple of questions. Um, one, is there similar types of development of models of usage of these kinds of nutrients in the ecosystems that are going to be affected by it, coastlines? And the second one is, are there plans or do you have access to the data for catastrophic events that may transport more of these nutrients all at once and cause the kinds of things you were talking about that the model doesn't quite get to? So thank you for those questions. Um, one of the things that the, the, the news working group, um, and it's about 30 people, are working on now is being able to, trying to um, quantitatively relate nutrient inputs to coastal ecosystem effects. Um, also within rivers or within the reservoirs or lakes within the river system as well. That's a huge challenge uh, because um, it really, um, you have to take into consideration not only the nutrient inputs, but the um, uh, physical and hydro hydrological, hydrographic uh, um, uh, conditions in the coastal zone as well. And so there's progress being made on that, uh, but we're not there yet. And um, it also involves um, a different suite of people, as you might expect, than we're in, to some extent, that, that we're involved in the, the river modeling um, work itself. But a very important point, and in fact, that was the reason for doing this to begin with. Um, and then your second question was, oh, catastrophic events. Yeah, we would love to be able to, to, do, to get at that. Um, one of the problems uh, or, or challenges there, again, goes back to usually during those catastrophic events, there are not measurements um, to capture those events to see how well even a model might be doing. But we should not let that stop us in that there is some information for some rivers on that. Um, and um, again, if one was trying to just optimize the modeling for one particular watershed, then that you can do that. But we're really trying to get a global picture, um, or at least a very large-scale regional picture. Um, but that's a very important thing to do, absolutely. <laughs> 